Yes, indeed. All right, take it away, Grant. All right, we are now recording. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grant Ganey. I'm on the Pulp team. I've worked at Red Hat for a long time. And the session we're going to be doing today or this morning is uh, on community use cases. And I'm hoping largely to be facilitating this. I mean, we're trying to gather information from our community that we might not already have. So I'm actually going to try and be quiet, which my coworkers know is a challenge. Um, let me see if I can share the uh, the document here. Let's try this. Community use cases. All right. I'm going to go look on the stream and see how that I should be sharing at this point. You are. Yes, I see it. OK, there we go. Just trying to see how that looks on the screen to the stream to make sure it's not big enough. Hang on. And maybe take it out of edit. Or um, both mode. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm going to we'll leave it in in just display mode for the moment. Um, I am going to be taking notes directly into the document, so um, I will probably switch it to edit mode, and so that people can uh, refer to it. Um, actually, hang on, hang on. I have an idea. My apologies for not thinking of this in advance. And if you're going to edit it, you also perfect. could consider just I keeping it in. I have it in a uh, separate tab so that I can edit it in one place and you all can look at it in the other place. All right, so welcome to the community use cases uh, meeting. Um, I'm going to go through a brief description of what we're trying to gain from this and then hopefully turn it over to the folks that are listening. So as you all know, Pull3 was designed largely uh, on top of uh, the, our experience with running Pulp 2 for several different stakeholders. Um, and a lot of what Pulp 3 does is very much informed by that experience. And what we would like over the course of this, uh, this hour is to um, learn more about the experience of folk that aren't actively on the Pulp team about um, what Pulp 3 is doing for you, what Pulp team is doing to you, what you would like it to do, what's the most important thing that we could do to make your lives better. And to kind of focus that discussion, um, I've put together four questions that um, I would like to let anybody give an opportunity to, to answering for us. Um, and those questions are, what, what is your problem that you're trying to solve? Give us a description of what your, your context is. Which plugins are you currently using to, to solve that problem? What does your workflow look like uh, when, when that problem is being solved? How do you, what do you do to uh, uh, produce the content that you're producing and how do you manage it? And is, if there was one thing that the Pulp team could do to make your life easier, let us know what that is. So those are the four questions. And what I'd like to do is just turn it over and say, uh, who would like to take a stab at answering those questions? I will sit here and take notes. I'm going to start picking on people in a minute. I suppose uh, I can volunteer some information. All right. Um, so we're using, we've been using Pulp2 um, to manage all of our internal and external repositories. Um, that was mainly uh, being able to ingest um, packages from third parties, be it EPEL, Red Hat directly, whatever, um, and control those packages into our estate um, via our release process. So we would be able to govern when a package gets upgraded um, and how it goes out to the affected systems um, and the speed at which it goes out. Um, with regards to the, the workflow, um, I suppose I, there's two examples. One is uh, where we're mirroring an upstream uh, location um, or data source 
uh, we will we have an, a notional dirty repo which is a verbatim copy of the public repo um, and then we have a notional trunk repository and packages make their way into trunk by us explicitly choosing which packages we want to promote um, this can either be based on security and bugger art, uh, based on uh, a specific request by an internal user wanting a package upgrade. Um, on a weekly basis, um, we take a copy of trunk um, and create a release of that copy. Um, and then over the preceding week, that repository gets presented up to different um, risk groups. Um, starting at the ones we care least about at first through to the ones we care the most about. Um, the plugins that we use currently are only the RPM plugin, um, but it, we would be looking to use uh, RPM file um, and containers initially um, with also a desire to use the Debian and possibly um, the PyPy um, plugin at a later date. Uh, with regards to Pulp 3, um, to make our life easier, I'm still in the very, very early stages of moving our own um, framework over to Pulp 3. Um, so I, I can't really comment on that. Um, if I was to say anything right now, um, it's the using the the client libraries um, and working out the best way to write our internal code um, to create a an rpm file container repo without if clauses um, everywhere in the code if rpm then specify an rpm href if file then specify a file href it would be much easier for us if if we didn't have to to include that. Um, but I'm I'm still fairly new to the to the Python game, so I'm hoping that it's that there is a, an easier way to work around that. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, could you elaborate on uh, the client uh, usage? Um, what do you mean about the if clauses? So um, let me let me get something up as I'm actively working on it at the moment. Give me one second. Reshuffle Windows. So at the moment, um, let's say I wanted to publish, uh, create a publication. Um, at least the way I'm doing it at the moment, I have to um, reference a RPM, RPM uh, publication um, with a, a particular, pardon? I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. You have to reference the publication with a particular word? Uh, um, so if I create an RPM publication, um, I have to create a publication model using the RPM um, RPM publication model. I, I understand I could do that um, just by passing through a dictionary, um, but I'm trying to use the models where possible um, because I think yeah. in the long run that will probably make my life less painful. Um, so if I wanted to uh, try and gen write code that will create a publication for a file type repository or an RPM type repository or um, possibly the, the container type repository, I need if, if it's one or the other or the other, I need to either generate an RPM publication model or a file type publication model um, as opposed to a slightly more generic publication model. I see. Yep. 
That ah. makes sense. Uh, yeah. Similarly, uh, when creating a, a distribution, um, one of the elements that I have to pass in is an RPM, RPM distribution equals, and then um, pass in the distribution model. Um, again, I'm having to explicitly specify that it's a, an RPM distribution type, as opposed to it being a slightly more generic endpoint that I'm, I'm connecting to. Yep. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to acknowledge that this could just be lack of experience on my part from a programming perspective. Yeah, and what is your uh, programming experience? Um, uh, so the first program I wrote was the uh, infrastructure to do our Pulp 2 um, coding uh, or release. And the next major one is Pulp 3. Cool. Um, I can um, give I... you a little bit of advice because um, we, we've implemented the, sort of the same thing on the Catello side using the bindings. And we, we used more of a, a class inheritance model where we sort of have a, we call them service classes. And so you instantiate a service class and then you can call like, you know, create remote or create distribution and it knows what to do to create that. And so instead of checking inside the class, oh, is this file, is this RPM, you actually instantiate a different class. So we might instantiate our own like RPM service class. And then that, that responds to create publication or whatnot. And then it knows all of those details um, instead of having if, if else statements within all of those functions. And that was one of the things that I was considering moving the abstraction away from a, a notional pulp server class to uh, a repo class. And then that would know whether it is a, what type of repo it is. Um, so you, you'd still have an if condition, but the if conditions at the type of time of instantiating the repo, not for every single call um, and method. Um, and it also offers more, um, I think it offers a better, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A one-to-one -one relationship with plugins. Um, different plugins may implement different feature sets. And if you do that on the notional repo, which would be a, a simile of a plugin, um, yeah. Okay, well, it's nice to know that someone else took a, a similar approach. Oh, that's a great exchange. Uh, anybody else have any questions for Douglas? Yeah, just the last thing is something similar as we experience in the CLI writing as of today. So we want to have almost the same commands for every repository type in the end. I'm I mean, some sure of this that means in form of collaboration or, or sharing code. That's actually a good point, Matthias. One of my questions, my, my question was, um, is, and this is, I'm not sure there's an answer to this right now, but something to, to meditate on is, is there a way we can make this kind of collaboration or shared code happen, right? This, does, this is code that doesn't live in any of the plugins. It doesn't live in pulp core. Maybe he doesn't live in the documentation, but it would be really useful for, say, if if Douglas were to coming to this problem like next month to be able to say, oh, look, here's here's a way that Catello has already solved this problem. And here's a way the CLI is already solving this problem. Can we think of a way to to make that more accessible to people? Anybody have any ideas offhand or just something for us to think about as we move forward here? I, th well, I think me, the best thing to recognize here is just that there is value in that tooling. How we build it, I don't know, but yeah. I mean, I think it's documentation, um, and uh, we have a very brief page that introduces the client libraries. Um, I think that should definitely be expanded to uh, real world examples of usage. 
And I, I'm just I agree. About linking to repositories that already exist and not necessarily like copy pasting code. I agree completely, but I feel like even if we did that and when we do that totally and completely, there will still be a gap. That is the unique perspective that I'm hearing from whoever was just speaking. Um, maybe Douglas. Uh, that uh, kind of like a library above the independent, the individual libraries um, that allows you to have, well, anyways, what, what Justin described earlier, basically. Yep. And Justin, you guys could make yours in Ruby and uh, <laughs> we could handle the Python one. Yeah. Well, so and part. I Part of it on our side, at least, is we are very opinionated about some things. And for Pulp 2, we spent uh, you know, a lot of effort building our, our Runcible library that was meant to be not very opinionated. And it didn't get a whole lot of traction. So we kind of took the opposite approach with our, the, that current layer, which is let's build something specifically for Catello that it, it's really instead of building a, a, an abstract layer that doesn't know about Catello and only knows about Pulp, we built a layer that knows about both and knows how to kind of talk between the two. And that is, I think, a better solution for us technically, but it means nobody else can really use that layer very easily. And I yep. think I think Pulp bindings replace Runcible, right? In the latest. A little bit. It's It's kind of a it's not necessarily, well, I wouldn't call it a one-to-one -one, um, mapping. Yeah, there's still another layer to it. Yeah. Yeah, the abstraction, uh, you're still left with the details of handling. Um, you know, if you want to have the same workflow for five content types, you have to implement five different sets of code in terms of the bindings usage. Yeah. So what I'm hearing here is that it would be worthwhile at some point to have a library that at least for Python, because we are Python developers ourselves, um, to release another library that's on top of our bindings. Interesting. Um, one of the use cases I might mention, because I know that um, I've spoken to Dennis about, I think it was Dennis about this in the past, um, and that is with with regards to, so we have the notion of two streams, the, the, the current release, um, which would be active in our um, primary environment, and then uh, the new release, which is coming up through the, the lower tiers. Um, we would, we will be looking to be able to promote a package um, into either the current or the new or both. Um, and at the moment, we can, I believe we can, when I say at the moment with Pulp 3, I believe we can do that with the versioning um, that's offered with Pulp 3. Um, but it's, it's fairly cumbersome to be able to do that. Um, we need to track multiple entry points or multiple versions where we split off. Um, if, when we, when, so this is easier to do on paper, um, but the, the current release um, might be version 10. Uh, the, the new release is version 14. Um, we also have notion of trunk, which has not yet made it into a release. It might be version 17. Um, when we need to promote a, a bug errata into current, um, that will make trunk plus one. Um, then we need to revert the trunk one back to what it was before. Um, and then you carry on growing if you then need to promote into the new it, it, it's just a lot of versioning that needs to be juggled. And it would be easier for us if when promoting into um, the notion of current, it, it effectively forks it at that point for that, for that particular version. Um, and we don't have to, to do the juggling back and forth. 
So it would be better if your versions were nonlinear or you had trees where you could split from the yes. bird. Very akin to branching. And then at some point, a branch may just fall off um, when it's no longer used and supported. So that sounds to me like, um, I mean, Catello does a lot of that work, correct, Justin? That, that Catello is involved with that kind of workflow, is that correct? We do. We do um, more of a branching workflow, and we're using it on top of the linear repo right. structure today, kind of. So it's, I think a, long, a while back, we had talked about a branching structure and just the complexity of it within Pulp. There, there wasn't a clear benefit for the added complexity um, at that time. I think there's actually an issue in our tracker about this, um, but we didn't prioritize it, so we never looked at it really. But there's an issue, I think. Or betrayus. Yeah, we've definitely discussed this in the past. Um, and the implementation details is where it all dropped off. <laughs> the yeah. devil's always in the details. <laughs> it's definitely going to be a hard uh, change, but I'm also curious if there's another way to support this better, like maybe using multiple repositories would be better suited for this. So I, I, that's the approach that we've taken in, in Pulp 2. Um, we've got multiple repos, and, and it works fine for that. It's just very expensive um, from a hour release takes circa five hours to complete because of the different repos that we're having to copy across. Um, and as we know, the bulk of that is not data migration. It's just m munging of the um, what is a repo. Um, hmm. That might be qu quicker in Pulp 3. Um, we're not looking to take that approach. Um, we're trying to use the native versioning. Yeah, in Pulp 3, you can create a new version based off a version of another repo. Um, you don't have to manually copy everything over to it yourself. So it may be faster. It may not be the right approach, but it, 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 it should, should, in theory, be a lot faster. Um, I wouldn't say it would be faster, at least like in terms of like code speed. Um, but yes, it would definitely be easier, probably. Well, if you take into account the fetching of all the units in one repo and then passing all the units in the other repo, even if it's not faster, the actual operation isn't faster, that uh, the total operation should be faster. So in this uh, scenario, each branch would be a different repository? Yes, that's what I'm hearing. And that we've seen this, we've seen this uh, pattern in other places. Um, specifically to, to address this exact issue, I have the classic, I have a dev set of repos that I'm doing really heavy active testing on. I have QA set of repos, that's my automated testing, and then I have the release repos. And I move content, I promote content from one to the other. And as long as everything is moving through my normal release cycle, then the linear versioning works. It's it's Douglas's first scenario, right? Uh, dev is, is 17 and QA is 14 and release is 10. And then there's a SEV1 CVE released and it just got announced and we have to get it onto all of our systems by midnight tonight or we're all fired. And that has to go like directly through the through the process or even skip directly to release and, and become available as fast as possible. That's a very, very real, real world use case. Um, and the, the question in, in my head, and I don't, again, I don't think this needs to be, this is an answerable here one is um, pulp, one of the things that we've done in Pulp 3 is try and focus Pulp more on a specific job. Like Pulp 3, for example, doesn't know about the clients that are subscribed to things. 
Um, pulp 3 doesn't care about applicability because its job is to manage the content and only manage the content. And whether this workflow belongs in Pulp 3 or whether it's built on top of Pulp 3 is a, is a question to, to think about. I don't have an answer to it, but um, the thing about microservices is you want to do one little thing and then and then uh, associate bunches of them to get a, get larger, more complicated activities. I, one I think I was going to say I think this struggle um, is that you know in the automation you build up the promotion process. And it's promoting this repository trunk to staging, staging to prod. And Pulp 3 is not a microservice. Um, <laughs> uh, the thing is, is that you spend all this time making that automation. And I feel like you need a second workflow on top of it. And I, I think the challenge is that you want to make sure that these two workflows work together so that yeah. you don't have to, like, so that they don't interfere with each other and create extra work. So what you could do, maybe, if I'm understanding this right, is if you have this particular package that needs to be promoted and it needs to be promoted quickly, um, the problem is, is that you can't just add it into trunk and use the normal workflow because now you're promoting a whole bunch of things through all the environments. So what you might do is add the this kind of a promotion, like the quick promotion process would be take the one package, put it into trunk, put it into staging, and put it into prod. And maybe that sounds overly simplistic, but it's the placing of a single package being the the promotion event. Um, or maybe you're putting it into trunk and staging and you're actually promoting all of staging to production. I'm not sure if you want the full package set there or not. But in, in the event that you don't, um, perhaps you need to, perhaps, perhaps maybe the crux of the issue now that I'm even talking about it, is that you want to test your staging environment and you want to test all the exact packages in staging. And so you have to take your staging environment back. And I guess this is where we get into the branching once more. Yeah. But but if you did just bring it, your staging environment back to an exact mirror copy of what your production environment is, add in the one package, uh, the normal promotion workflow would effectively reset the pipeline back to what it's supposed to be. So maybe it's not so so bad. Um, part, of, yeah. part of the difference between Pulp 2 and Pulp 3 uh, is the ability to reset back into a particular point in time. And I think this is one of the main meaningful differences between Pulp 2 is that that going back to what you had before is was especially difficult in Pulp 2. And um, I may not have been so certainly discussing this previously. I know that I can do that. So I would um, effectively, let's say I needed to promote a, a particular CVE um, and it needed to go we didn't care about testing it, it just needed to go out. Um, we can reset the repository to the version associated with um, with uh, uh, the, the current main release. We can put the package in um, and do a um, publication and update the distribution. Then we reset the version to the new release, um, do the same again, and then reset the version to um, notional trunk, um, and then carry on as, as if nothing had happened. Um, my only concern is that's an awful lot of versions that you're bouncing back and forth between, mm -hmm. um, and it's quite a lot of logic. I do, one of the reasons why we would rather not go down the route of um, spinning up multiple repos is it allows us to keep um, what's been going on in a single place. So if we need to go back in time and look to see what's been happening, what's been added and removed, we can use Pulp's native versioning for that. If we start spinning up other repos, um, then we'd need to start knowing which repo was relevant for which release. It's relatively easy to do. It's just not as easy as being able to look at a single timeline of one repo. Yep, Thank that you. makes perfect sense. Um, what about, uh, we have uh, a feature planned, I don't know for when, but adding tags and being able to um, basically 
tag different repositories, different remotes, and group them basically by those tags. And then you would be able to have uh, different repositories that represent those different environments um, and have them be actually tagged and grouped together so you can easily uh, know which ones go together. Would that make your life easier? Possibly. Um, I think I'd need to be a bit more familiar to, to be able to say yay or nay. Um, we've, we've got a fairly extensive salt configuration um, that, that deals with association of repositories to hosts. Um, so I'm not sure that that would be valuable, but it may, it may be very useful when it comes to us notionally cutting a release. Um, how, which versions of which repositories were associated with that release. That would be exceptionally helpful um, because at the moment we're looking at possibly having an additional um, Postgres table that deals with what what is a release? What, what is that release? Which version? So if I need to merge in uh, a fix uh, CVE to a repo, Okay, well, which version do I need to merge it into? Um, and by the sounds of it, the tag may address that. Um, if I just need to associate a release with a tag and then I can see everything associated with that tag, it would, it would probably be helpful, yes. That's very cool. Uh, Douglas, we may we may be leaning on you as we start implementing the tagging feature <laughs> to have you uh, have you vet things like the the use cases and feature yeah. list. I, I, um, I do hop on to, to IRC and um, I, I think it may be Tatiana, um, possibly based on, on the name that keeps on suggesting I should subscribe to the mailing list and I probably should. Yes, please. <laughs> 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 also, for you may not realize this, but we all have all realized is that when when Tanya makes a suggestion, <laughs> what that means is no, really, go do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, listen, this is uh, this has been great, and I really appreciate the feedback. We have 15 minutes. I would like to at least open the floor and see is there is there someone else who would like to answer some of these questions for us. Uh, Wibbit has done a great job uh, uh, describing his particular scenario. Who else might want to uh, take a, a stab at the four questions I have here? I'm... Oh, well, Sebastian, it's here. All right. Well, I can talk about. Rui and how pulp is used in Rui. Briefly. Uh, yeah, so here I represent the, the team of Rui developers, and Rui is a Red Hat update infrastructure, uh, which is a highly scalable, highly redundant framework that enables you to manage repositories and content. So basically, uh, Rui is used to uh, primarily uh, by cloud providers to deliver content to to the instances that they are being provisioned there, and to manage both custom and Red Hat provided content. Okay, now to four questions. Right. Um, yeah, what plugins do we use? Um, so right now, uh, the current version of Rui, which is in production, is Rui 3. And that is based on Pulp 2. And um, if I'm, as a relatively new newcoming person to Rui team, uh, I would say that uh, Rui 3 uses Pulp RPM, Pulp File, maybe OS3 plugin, 
while currently RUI 4, which is in development, and that is based on PAL 3, currently uses PAL RPM plugin. Um, okay, next question. Yeah, what one thing could PAL 3 do to make your life easier? Well, I can think of several things, but I would say that currently, uh, the chaining of the uh, syncing and publishing operations and optionally a uh, distribution operation into a single operation uh, as far as a scheduled task is concerned could make our life much easier. Mm, yeah, uh, another thing that we also looked into that could also make uh, our life easier is uh, to have certain APIs amended to, to reflect the uh, or to enrich the information on the scheduled tasks that uh, haven't yet been allocated or assigned to worker threads. Um, What else? I mean, um, general or, workflow or something like that, yeah. I just wanted to quickly, quickly ask what kind of information you would be helpful for you to see in those tasks which are uh, still yeah. waiting. What information do you at the moment yeah the information on the on the repository is that those tasks are assigned to or or related to because that information is only available to repositories that or sorry to tasks that are picked up by workers and that are in a running state while i'm talking about the tasks that are in a waiting state and i cannot through the rest api endpoints i cannot uh cannot say which repositories are assigned what tasks or related to what tasks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sebastian, can I ask, um, and actually I'm going to go back to Douglas in a second too, so you might be able to answer the same question. Um, when you're talking about Rui, what's the scale you operate in terms of, you know, how many how many repos, for example, does a, a typical Rui instance deal with? And what's your what's been your experience working at whatever scale that is? Okay, yeah. Uh, Martin, are you maybe yeah, present? I can, or... I can answer that question. So uh, in this moment, you need to uh, defer two kinds of customers uh, for Rui. One kind of customer, both of them are what we call cloud providers, but one and there is more of them is basically providing content for their internal clients. Those are big companies that have tens of thousands of machines and internally they are running Rui uh, so that they can sync the content on one place and they don't need to sync from CDN, from you know outside internet. They usually run Rui in some kind of DMZs and syncing from CDN to Rui, all the Red Hat content and then providing it internally. And then there is a special kind of uh, cloud providers and those are the cloud providers that are real clouds, Amazon, uh, Azure, Alibaba Cloud, uh, Huawei Cloud, Google uh, Google Cloud Engine, those are providing the content for basically the external customers for them. But so those big ones, we are talking about 2,000 repos synced daily, twice a day, and for those small ones, usually it's really they pick only the repos they want. For example, they are currently running on RHEL 7, so they pick all the RHEL 7, possibly EUS, E4S versions, 
uh, some of them are doing like the freezing of the repos. Uh, they don't want to use satellites, so they basically take a repo, create a custom repo, and copy all the content uh, from that repo into that custom repo and freeze it in time in that moment. And then when, for example, some CVE comes, some security bug, they just upload it uh, directly to that custom repo. For that purpose, uh, what we need is to be able to add uh, a metadata pair um, per repo, the metadata that contains a GPG key for the files. Because by default, when you create a custom uh, custom repo, you upload there the RPMs and they can be signed by anything. But what we do in Rui is that we provide the possibility to uh, basically say this is a Red Hat GPG key. The, all the files in this repo are signed by this key, even though it's not, uh, you know, a mirror of CDN repo. It still contains all the repo, uh, all the RPMs that are Red Hat. So that's the metadata that's I think currently missing in um, Pulp three as a as a you know a general metadata field, a text field or something like that. So that's, that's, I think, the most uh, difficult task <laughs> in uh, Pulp 2 is uh, administration of those thousands of uh, repos. You are using Pulp Admin and you are monitoring wait queues, running queues, uh, waiting tasks, running tasks, uh, Searching for those tasks is uh, quite difficult. If you want to search for a task that ran like six hours ago in a in a task list for a thousands of repos, it's really, <laughs> really a, a challenge to find it. Not talking about finding it in MongoDB is basically impossible for in in this size. So, yeah, but. Does it answer the, the question? Thousands. Like I think uh, for those uh, big cloud providers, we are talking about three, three to four terabytes of uh, Red Hat content synced. Wow. Okay. Scale. Um, Douglas, how does that uh, match with what you're doing? What, what kind of scale in terms of number of repos are you typically dealing with in your environment? Probably a similar a similar number of repos, though they're not all as active um, as Martin's uh, example, but similar in number and similar size of data on disk. Um, so obviously much more presented to clients. Um, we don't have as many client systems. We've only got said about 2000 um, we have multiple pulp servers um, where we sync uh, we've got the notion of a primary um, and then um, secondary servers scattered around the data centers um, that sync against the the primary um, with our own tooling written to to manage that synchronization and report on any deltas in any of the repos That's really interesting, especially the, the primary secondary approach is useful to me anyway. Nice. Questions, folks, we have four minutes. Um, yes, the, the chaining of uh, commands like uh, sync publish, would it help if that is done on the client side? If we like had a library that was able to start a sync task, wait for it to finish, and then do the publishing? Mm. Basically, what this is what we are doing right now. So okay. I guess that wouldn't make, make uh, our life easier than that. Because yeah. it's not a difference, I see. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's important yeah. to understand that we works basically that uh, pulp is one node, and then there are CDS nodes that are um, providing the content via a web server. So those CDS nodes work as a client in this uh, your particular example. <clears throat> Douglas, uh, do you uh, do any sort of backups of your pulp <laughs> servers? No. <laughs> and she laughs. Yeah, yeah. We're all we're all like, yeah. <laughs> so, so in in all honesty, uh, to answer that, we we've got the fact that we've got the primary and secondary nodes. If the primary blew up, we could. <laughs> with an awful lot of effort, promote one of the secondaries to a notional primary and carry on working that way. Though realistically, um, we would look to rebuild the primary as soon as possible and then just ingest the data back from one of those secondaries. Um, they're in massively diverse locations. So the likelihood of us, unless it was a, a form of corruption, um, a very unusual form of corruption, the, the likelihood of, of it being a problem is minimal. Um, and we also store uh, every release we cut, we store a copy of the RPM related data in a separate database. Um, so if I really, 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 really had to, wouldn't, but if I did, I would be able to reference that data to reconstruct um, the, the meaningful content in the repositories. <clears throat> It happened to us once, if you want the story. Like we didn't lost, we didn't lost the content on the disk because obviously uh, all the RPM content is stored um, either on clusters, so more nodes available or in uh, solutions that the cloud providers themselves have in place that is also like backed up by them. So. We didn't lose the, the RPMs, but we lost the the node, the, the, the database, the pulp database. And what was done was that the node was reinstalled. And then since we have automation, we have a complete listing of the repos that we need. So we just run uh, a resync of all the repos with the data the storage that was intact was mounted. So all the pulp had to do is, you know, check all the files. And in fact, it took the same ta amount of the time as uh, the complete syncing of the, <laughs> of the, uh, that content would take from CDN. Yeah. But it's yeah. able, it, it was able to, you know, pick up from that situation. And if you'd had a, a database dump in in pulp three terms, the Postgres dump stored somewhere, you could have just restored that dump, correct? Do you think, Martin, that would have solved that problem? Uh, we don't have that much experience with pulp three yet, so right. we cannot we cannot like say it would probably uh, shave some time from you know. The restoration period. But the, the main point is since the data was physically uh, on the on a, a disk that were okay, and those CDS nodes are just you know a web servers providing the content. Actually, the customers were were still getting the content. It was just that for the time till we fixed it, uh, a new you know, updates were not available. Interesting, interesting. I'd love to see the root cause for, uh, or the post-mortem for that. It must have driven you guys crazy. Um, it is currently 10.51, we're a little over time, um, and I wanna let people go so everybody can have a chance to have a bio break and grab another cup of whatever you're drinking before we go to the next session. I'd like to thank um, Sebastian and Martin and Douglas. This has been, for me, certainly really useful and I uh, appreciate your feedback. Um, we look forward to seeing you guys in Pulp's IRC channels and we really look forward to seeing you on the Pulp mailing lists. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm going to stop recording. Thank you all. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Uh